Well, during SARS, I was actually in the children's hospital, so we actually didn't have cases, but we did have um, suspect cases which we had to forward to uh, Tan Tok Seng. But nevertheless, the whole laboratory was on alert, and, and we expected any time to get specimens from patients unsuspectingly um, who might be suspected of, of having SARS. And, and in fact, we did it. One or two of them um, um, actually had severe cases, which actually turned out to be other things like adeno, virus right but what was interesting it, it came um at the time when actually um things just happened coincidentally about a few months before we had completed uh, some studies of respiratory viruses in um, adults and children and i think it was the first time we used a technique called pcr at that time it was not a standard lab technique and i think sars was the first time in which pcr was used uh, as a diagnostic technique in a um, infectious disease outbreak. Yeah, if I remember correctly, um, for some of the hospitals, the machine had not had just been delivered just about the month before and it was brand new and hadn't even been tried or tested out. So I thought it was an interest, so although I was not directly involved, I was I think it was a example, I don't know whether it's fortuitous or not, of how technology came just at the right time and they were able to adapt and 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 use it to address a new a strange outbreak. So obviously, um, after SARS, um, there was a lot of talk and preparation going, which went on to prepare ourselves for the next uh, outbreak, particularly uh, another kind of SARS scenario. Um, and also, uh, SARS was in 2002, right? And in 2005, um, we had cases of avian influenza from Indonesia. And that's when all our labs also started to um, uh, get themselves prepared for a pandemic with exercises. We set up PCR tests for influenza. Um, the pandemic again came at another fortuitous time because this time the public, National Public Health Lab had just been set up uh, physically not too long ago. And we had been training the staff in the hospitals um, at, um, on the techniques, including starting some flu surveillance with PCR again. Again, at that time, no one else in Singapore was doing routine diagnostic or surveillance using PCR. Right? And we actually moved into the new uh, laboratory. It was a makeshift but workable laboratory at Tan Tok Seng Hospital. That was in April 2009. And in, on the 20, 20, 20th of uh, April, we had a call notifying us of a potential pandemic strain. So it was again just in time that our facilities uh, were ready to tackle pandemic flu. Of course, at that time, uh, we already had several hospitals trained in flu PCR, but nevertheless, the pandemic, pandemic meant that we um, had to uh, help them and roll out uh, the diagnostic test. We also had to take on a um, vast amount of surveillance in the community. Um, whereas the hospitals were basically handling diagnostics in the hospital patients. And on top of uh, helping to uh, test, do the test for pandemic influenza, um, we had to um, harness new capabilities to track the virus, to sequence them, and also to work with researchers um, in the research institutions. By that time, we are also very well linked with the influenza uh, WHO collaborating centers for influenza, particularly the one in Melbourne. So even as it went on, we were able to track genetic changes, discuss problems, discuss uh, issues with resistance testing um, with our partners, not just locally but overseas. So the difference between 2002 and 2009 was a huge difference. At that time, we were ready. In 2002, the PCR we took about, we had to take maybe three days, four days, sometimes for a result. In 2009, anything more than uh, 12 hours sometimes would be too long. In fact, we had to turn around some results within four hours while patients were waiting at the emergency departments. Okay, the National Public Health Laboratory is a laboratory um, which was set up under the Ministry of Health. Its purpose is to provide laboratory support to support um, outbreaks of communicable disease and to perform continuing surveillance of uh, various pathogens which might ca cause public health problems.
but it will also have to deal with emerging diseases as well as rare things like bio threats. And this role is to use the best possible science available to perform these studies to protect the health of the people of Singapore. And the difference between that and the diagnostic laboratory is that the diagnostic laboratory's job is to um, establish a diagnosis of the infecting pathogen in the individual patient to help the physician manage the patient. And what happens after that is that um, the hospital labs will then forward specimens and samples to the public health laboratory who will do more detailed analysis of the uh, various viruses and bacteria and, and to use them um, not so much to diagnose the individual but to, to so-called diagnose the cause of an outbreak or diagnose trends in the changes of uh, pathogens. Right. Would you like me to give you a history of it? So actually public health microbiology um, um, as a separate entity was probably quite a recent concept because we realized by 2007 that the techniques and, and the workflow and all that for public health investigation in this modern age would be very different from a diagnostic laboratory. For example, we use more uh, experimental instruments, right? whereas diagnostic laboratories have to use fairly standard methods to diagnose common conditions, whereas we look after rare conditions. In the old days, um, um, that means a few decades ago, you know, 50 years ago, whatever, you know, public health and, and diagnostic work would be basically involving the same techniques, the same laboratories. So that would have started off as the Institute of Pathology Laboratory, which was a government laboratory. Um, 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 and that would have been the only laboratory in Singapore doing uh, human specimens, looking at infectious disease in humans, um, which is not on a research basis. But of course, that was before my time, so I can't tell you much. Um, by the time I started in microbiology, um, Singapore General Hospital had just had become a restructured hospital, right? Whereas focus was very much on, on the hospital and their own patients rather than, than uh, performing a national role. It's partly to do with how you concentrate the expertise, partly to do with funding, partly to do with a lot of administrative issues. But mind you, at that time when I started, that was about 25 years ago, around that time, public health laboratory at that time uh, public health functions would have been uh, found in a few different labs. Um, in fact, the lab at Alexandra Hospital, and that those buildings are probably the only ones left of the original labs, although the original lab is not there. Alexandra Hospital was the place where they did all the stool uh, pathogens like typhoid and cholera and salmonella. And in those days, um, in the 60s, 70s, not before my time, 70s, 80s, that would have been the main public health problems, right? Football illnesses, right? So you could consider the Alexander Lab as one of the original public health laboratories. We also had the central TB laboratory at uh, Tan Tok Seng Hospital, right? And that would have been the other major public health problems, right? And, and, and so in fact, SGH would be, lab, would be doing things like viruses, you know, um, which relatively wasn't so much in the public health consciousness at that time, although you had influenza surveillance, um, hand foot mouth surveillance. Um, influenza was basically monitored symptomatically. We didn't really collect that many specimens at that time. And we had, the other aspect of public health was we had the chlamydia and uh, laboratory for sexually transmitted disease also at SGH in a separate uh, um, uh, building at, at, at the uh, SGH camp, at the Ultram Road campus then. So, so that was those of the public health functions which were spread out over different um, um, places in Singapore. Um, what happened was that with restructuring and, and progress of time, I think hospitals, and at that time, uh, 25 years ago, Singapore General Hospital ran the only diagnostic laboratory um, for microbiology, apart from NUH, which had started in 1985, and then SGH, start, and then SGH started to plant satellite labs in the new, uh, in, in the other hospitals like uh, uh, Topayo Hospital, um, uh, KK Hospital, and Tan Lok Seng Hospital, right? So we, we sent out staff to man those satellite labs, which eventually developed into their own full-fledged, uh, uh, fairly complex microbiology laboratories. Now, so for public health laboratory, 
I think the first, um, as I recall, the first uh, call for public health laboratory occurred just after the Nipah virus outbreak in about 1990, um, where Nipah virus uh, was an example of an emerging disease which um, did affect some of the abattoir workers in Singapore and caused a lot of concern because of the, it was a biohazardous and, and it was unknown at one time, you know, its characteristics. And after that, um, the Singapore General Hospital, we proposed the Ministry of Health that we should look into public health laboratory because we needed a laboratory working outside the confines or scope of a diagnostic laboratory to do things at a national level, a lab which also can have dedicated expertise for public health and which could also um, respond whenever there was a need to respond, um, um, particularly with large numbers of specimens without affecting the daily work. So that was the first call for public health laboratory. At that time, it wasn't very clear whether it should be a uh, laboratory separately under the Ministry of Health, whether Singapore General Hospital would uh, somehow become a public health laboratory, but that was not quite favoured, or whether there could be a central laboratory which was somehow uh, uh, controlled by stakeholders from various hospitals. Right? <laughs> but, so that was the first thing, time. And the second call was obviously after SARS. So, so that was 1990, around that. SARS 2000, sorry, 19, 1990, sorry, 1998. Yeah, 1998 was, was uh, Nipah virus. Sorry. Uh, 1998 to 2000, after SARS, I remember by 2003, we, all our microbiologists were called together for a few meetings in rooms and we discussed the issue, what should we do with public health, uh, um, microbiology, should we set up a laboratory? And I think generally we are in, in agreement, but again, um, for various reasons, um, um, it took time to, for the idea to, to really grow, you know. The next impetus was in 2005, right? 2005, around June, um, we received news that in Indonesia had its first avian influenza case. Now, the avian influenza had been in Hong Kong for a number of years, but when it hit in Indonesia, uh, we became very conscious of how um, uh, close it was to our shores. And at that time, we also had uh, fresh management and uh, uh, to address all these issues, and, and, and that was, again, another, another impetus to really look into um, how to set up a public health laboratory. And that was when I was uh, invited to help to set it up to look into the issue. Right? So in 2007, funding, the first initial tranche of funding for the laboratory was finally approved. But we did have a problem. We had no place to put a public health laboratory. Right? <laughs> we had funds, but no place. So what we started off, we started small, we started recruiting staff one by one. We started with what I thought priority areas like influenza and, and we, we parked them in hospitals like Tan Tok Seng, um, in hospitals like NUH, um, where they started to learn their techniques, right? And we started with um, some salmonella work, some influenza work, and that's about it. That's about all we had time, time for. And then so we... As I mentioned earlier, in 2009, we finally moved to our first influenza lab in Tan Tok Seng Hospital just one month before the pandemic. And we were very, uh, was very glad that they were able to handle this new um, influenza strain, this new uh, need for, for doing things fast, accurately, um, in a short space of time. In two, shortly after that, about a year later, we acquired more space. This was at the SGH campus where the Duke NUS um, laboratories had just vacated. So we took over their laboratories. Again, these were not very custom built uh, or these were not places which actually were built for laboratory to function. So they were not ideal. And so um, finally, in 2014, we, we uh, moved up. Uh, uh, a large part of our operations to a bar police in the new Synapse building. So now we have it at the Synapse building, we have it at the Tan Tok Seng, and recently we also had um, 
a BSL3 unit um, um, which we shared together with NUS when it opened last year in, in NUS. And this we are waiting for the new NPHL within the NCID, that's the National Center for Infectious Disease at Tan Tok Seng, uh, which we hope will be ready in 2018 or shortly thereafter. Okay, um, I'm, I'm usually a bit shy or hesitant talking about myself as research because I always feel, I always like to reserve the term research to my colleagues who are doing basic research to find new exciting things which we have not known about, you know. But be that as it may, um, I'll, just ex I'll just use it, use the term very broadly. Um, um, because to me, what I do is basically part of the investigative work, part of looking at new methods, part of um, finding out and investigating new, new, new things. And, and often, I must admit, they are quite incremental, nothing fantastic. But like, we hope that even with this, um, um, it's by these small incremental steps sometimes that uh, which are needed for our day-to-day -day work. I remember my first paper, in fact, was on... Uh, antibiotic-resistant enterococci, that was uh, a fairly new thing in 1990, right? And, and years later, antibiotic-resistant enterococci has become a major and widespread issue, such that when, when they find certain uh, sensitive strains, in fact, they ask me, are you sure it is susceptible, right? So, so, the, so I'm not sure how that actually helped, but certainly, certainly we got to grips with... Um, and started to monitor when it started to be introduced into Singapore. Right? Um, um, one of my first um, so-called nominations for research kind of prize or whatever in, in, that was in SGH was also work on the HIV um, molecular types. At, at which time HIV was just starting its exponential um, rise in, just starting its rise in Singapore in the early 1990s. So we wanted to know for us between Asia and the West, um, what kind of um, genotypes we have. And, 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 um, and so we did publish an early paper on that, um, which at least gives some background at that time. I wouldn't say it had been terribly um, useful by at least, well, some, but, but, but you do actually at least have, we actually do have at least now early data to, to compare in 1994. And in fact now, HIV epidemiology is one of the uh, pressing issues because HIV is one of the uh, infections where, where con transmission continues to occur, uh, the demographics continue to change, and so do the viruses. And in fact now, we are still doing HIV epidemiology, still doing HIV molecular typing, but using much more sophisticated methods. I, how shall we facilitate more microbiology research? I, I think it's, it's important to, um, I think it's important to be able to just respond to what we have around, right? I, I would say that the funding for microbiology and infectious disease research has actually seen quite some changes in the past uh, five, five, ten years, right, where we have several sources of funds, some of them specifically encouraging collaboration among the different uh, hospitals, some encouraging uh, collaboration between basic scientists and clinicians as, as part of the other MOH grants, and also special grants which are given out for, uh, to meet public health objectives, and I think that's, that's great. But I think the most important thing actually to develop people who have that mental approach to their work, right? Uh, to want to answer questions, to want to solve questions, and people who are able to think deep and to know the techniques. Um, but also we want microbiologists who are broad, broad, not just deep, but broad. In other words, they have an interest and knowledge of the uh, changing uh, um, clinical circumstances in which infectious disease take place. They have an appreciation of uh, public health in the community on a global level, right? I, and I think we need to bring in to have really bright people and, and to train them broadly. One thing we really have not um, given them enough, we, microbiology training has been a bit narrow uh, 
so far. And I think uh, we, we may need to formalize things so that they have better exposure to public health and, and to clinical infectious disease. Um, the other thing is that in microbiology, in, in, a, in a hospital setting, the medical microbiologists tend to, tend to be very um, focused on diagnosis. Um, such that, and now that research methods have actually become very advanced, very often they are not the same methods which are used in diagnosis. So there's a need to expose microbiologists to, to research methods as well. Sometimes they may not be basic scientists and they can't most of the time, but it should enable them also to work hand in hand with the basic researchers. Right? So the way I see it is not just microbiology research done by microbiologists or their scientists, but it's how they interact with the basic scientists, um, how they interact with the clinicians, and how they interact with the public health epidemiologists, and how to put things together. Okay. To me, I, I view the, the pressing or the, the future infectious disease threats into a few categories. One, are those things which are really catastrophic, meaning when they happen, many people can die, or there's a lot of disruption to society, a lot of disruption to our economy, things which will really affect not just our health, but our society, our economy, and the way our country is run, right? And my crystal ball is that there's only, okay, I'm, I'm just putting my leg out, uh, how should I put it? Uh, um, but I think, I'm basic, I think in terms of viruses, the, the main threat would still be influenza. Despite all these reports of viruses and all that kind of thing, one of the main things which can really disrupt society is still influenza because it is still the only virus which, can, which has been proven to spread and have the biological properties to spread among the human population. And you can't do too much about it apart from um, having some vaccines which may not be in time or keeping people apart, which can only slow the spread a little bit, not that much. So influenza, new influenza strain, new influenza pandemic strains, right? That's, that's one thing. Uh, the, the, the second thing which can really disrupt our society, unfortunately, is the malicious use of um, biological agents, basically bioterrorism, right? Whether it's in terms of a bomb device, contamination, sabotage, that kind of thing can really disrupt society, right? And, and I think we have to give priority to both of them, right? Both as a system in the hospital, um, um, that our hospitals, our GPs all get ready to respond to them. We can recognize them, we can detect them, we can um, um, react to them in our many different ways and, 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 and to have plans um, to deal with those. The second threat is a bit kind of more simmering and slow moving, but it's nonetheless it's still a threat, um, which is antibiotic resistance, right? The, our bacteria in particular, um, I mean, uh, accumulating antibiotic resistance has been shown to have escaped into the community in some countries, and, 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 and some of it is already in our community, in our long-term care facilities, and, and, and even in, in the healthy community. So, so I think um, antibiotic resistance um, can be a problem because there, there just aren't enough antibiotics to, 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 to catch up with the bacteria, right? Um, how can we address that infection control, antibiotic stewardship? But it's actually a multi-pronged approach and it's a lot more study. But one other aspect of antibiotic resistance, which I think really also is a threat, um, is somehow T drug resistant tuberculosis, right? It is an organism which is an old one and it has never gone away and will never go away, right? Um, Singapore is a very open society, so we have a mix of local transmission of TB. We also have importation of TB because we have many foreigners, visitors, uh, people passing through or staying here. And we are beginning to see problems in, 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 in uh, some of the other Asian countries, in our neighboring countries. And, and TB can still spread like it has in the past through coughing through the air. And, and so it will be a challenge, right? The resistance rates in Singapore have slowly crept up. It's not as high as in some countries, but it's still a worry for us. 
right? Tuberculosis. Um, and the last category, um, hopefully we don't need to talk about it, but, but and, and that will happen if there's natural disaster or some disruption of the infrastructure. In other words, um, um, so Singapore, we seem to be fairly um, um, protected from natural disasters, earthquakes, typhoons, and all that, right? But you can imagine if anything in other countries where we have a flood of refugees, a flood of people, uh, sanitation breaks down and all that, you know, all those extreme scenarios, uh, kind of doomsday scenario where, where, so, where, where, where the infrastructure of society breaks down, then we'll be exposed to all the classical infectious diseases. Hopefully, Singapore will be stable and strong for the next 50 years, and we don't have to deal with that. I think the fantastic thing is that um, I have seen the generations of microbiology. I've had the privilege of working with the um, the older generation of microbiologists. I had the pleasure of working with the first, second, and third generation of infectious disease physicians. I have the great pleasure of working with the epidemiologists and. And since the pandemic, I've also worked with biostatisticians, I've worked with uh, public health uh, research people. And, and, and I tell you, with each generation we, we have, um, I can just see that the talent which you have, the people, not just the talent, but the people with the drive, the motivation, the intellectual capacity. Um, so, so we have such a tremendous um, uh, potential in Singapore. And, and I think, I think we should just, I think we are in the right, right direction. We, we need to, the most important thing is that we, we need to be able to ask the right questions, right? Because without asking, asking the right questions, we might be going down the wrong path, waste money and all that, you know? So, so I, think, I think the important thing is that we are able to ask the right questions and then to, to address them and, and to address them using all our different capabilities, different talents, different inputs. Right? From what I can see with the, the, the new generation of physicians and researchers, I think that's, that's very much encouragement. I think people, we, we always um, say that we have not enough time, not enough money. There will never be enough time, there will never be enough money, but you can always have enough uh, motivation. So what I was saying, I, I think that we, we do have such a bright new bright young pool of uh, physicians and researchers and scientists so my wish is to be able to ask good questions and to be able to answer them and that these answers will benefit not just our patients but our community and not just people in Singapore but people um, elsewhere in the world